I'm John Bassler. This is the John Bassler Show in Tbilisi, Georgia, with Malcolm Holmline, Conference of Presidents. This is the El Al Middle East Report on the road. Uh, Bob Hope and Bing Crosby on the road. Ba, 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 boom. Brought to you thanks to the mm-hmm. generous sponsorship of El Al, the National Airlines of Israel, which tra- translated us from New York to Tel Aviv, where we switched to a Tel Aviv carrier and came here to Tbilisi, Georgia. It's on the Black Sea. We're in Tbilisi, which is five hours by driving to the interior. However, it's not very far. And We're in the mountains. However, we see the headlines that uh, McMaster, the National Security Advisor, is using a term self-determination. And then we see the headlines that Tillerson, the Secretary of State, is talking about going wobbly on moving the embassy. Knowing that we're going to be in Jerusalem when the president arrives uh, within a few days' time and, and we will not be able to drive, we go immediately to Jonathan Shanzer of the Foundation for the Defense of Democracies. Malcolm and I have much to tell you about what we found in Tbilisi, about why we're going on to Baku soon enough. But when you see a headline like self-determination, you go immediately to Jonathan. Mr. Shanzer, a very good evening to you. Woodrow Wilson has been dead for almost 100 years. What the (laughs) heck is self-determination? Malcolm and I, when we saw this headline, I said to Malcolm immediately, I see. This means you get to hold an election every 10 years. Good evening to you, Jonathan. <laughs> Good evening. Well, the uh, the term self-determination is certainly a loaded one politically. Uh, this is certainly giving hope to the Palestinians that this could be the president that ultimately recognizes a Palestinian state. It's a reversal of fortune for Mahmoud Abbas, who I think uh, three or four months ago was probably expecting a very rocky road uh, given that uh, President Trump had longstanding close ties uh, to Benjamin Netanyahu, that his uh, son-in-law, Jared Kushner, had close ties to the Israelis, uh, that you had this uh, uh, team of people who were going to be coming in that, uh, by, by all accounts, were going to stack the deck on, on behalf of the Israelis and make it uh, a, a, a cakewalk for them, uh, so to speak, with uh, with regard to the two-state solution and concessions on settlements or concessions on some of the core elements of the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. And now what we're seeing is key people uh, within the Trump administration, as well as the president himself, uh, giving lip service to uh, Palestinian self-determination, uh, backtracking on the question of the uh, the embassy move, uh, and of course, just uh, talking more broadly about a deal that would ultimately bring an end to the Palestinian-Israeli conflict. This is not an easy undertaking, but yet this does appear to be the goal now of the Trump administration, and it has some in Israel very worried. So if this is what Abbas got from his trip to Washington last week, what did he give? Did he commit to doing anything that is really meaningful to send a message to the Israelis? He certainly didn't stop the money to the terrorists and rewarding them. As I understand it, and I had a couple of different readouts, I actually attended the Abbas um, uh, uh, party afterwards. He had a, some sort of a, an event afterwards where he gave a speech uh, at a Washington, D.C. hotel, speaking to people who were close to the, to the Palestinian president. I heard that there was nothing in the way of concessions granted during that time, that this was really kind of a meet and greet for the, for the American president to meet his Palestinian counterpart. I should note that just even having the Palestinian flag alongside the uh, the U.S. flag um, inside the White House was, I think, a victory for the Palestinians. There did not appear to be any uh, difficult moments uh, during that uh, during that time. Uh, I think really what what as we understand it anyway, the that President Trump was trying to establish a rapport with Abbas. Uh, to lay the groundwork for, uh, I guess, the start of negotiations, uh, whether this month or at some point in the summer. In addition, Jonathan, this remark by Secretary of State Tillerson that we're... Malcolm, how was it put that we're, he's, not, he's not certain about moving the embassy? It was some delicate some, diplomatic uh, uh, language. Uh, uh, avoidance language. Avo- yes, uh, going wobbly, Jonathan. It, is this tied to McMaster's um, tr- non-transparent remark, or are these two working separately to, uh, to confuse us? 
I think it's difficult to read too much into this right now. I mean, I think, look, we, we know that H.R. McMaster has always seen uh, the Palestinian-Israeli conflict as something that, that, that should be solved that would make it easier for the U.S. military to operate abroad, and we can agree or disagree with that. But I think it's, it's very it, – it, I think it's very – uh, it's a different topic entirely when we start talking about the embassy. And moving the U.S. embassy would not change the conflict in any significant way. It doesn't address any of the core issues of the conflict itself. In other words, we're not talking about borders. Uh, we're not talking about the makeup of Jerusalem. It, it doesn't impact refugees. This is simply where the United States would be operating within Israel, where its primary offices might be. Uh, and so, you know, we've heard for some time that the uh, th that the Trump administration is, of course, weighing this. Uh, I think there were concerns about destabilization. Of course, the Palestinians had been threatening that that violence could erupt and that they could potentially uh, prompt that violence to erupt should the United States make this move. I think since that time, I, I think it's been put to rest that the Palestinians would not do uh, anything of the sort. But I do think that there are still some uh, some concerns about perhaps a spontaneous uprising within the PA. And so this is the kind of thing that Israeli and and uh, and U.S. officials do need to coordinate. Um, I do think that it should still be on the table. It certainly doesn't seem to be ruled out, but I think going wobbly is probably a fine way of putting it for now. And this especially, as John pointed out, the uh, earlier statements, which sort of were absolute about moving the embassy, even talk about doing it on the first uh, day, and whether or not that is the criteria by which we would measure it, it certainly sends a message. Uh, and I, I think the, the uh, question now builds up to such a large one for the president on his trip that if he doesn't do it, then, of course, it will be judged by many in that light. Do you think that the, the follow-up meeting in Saudi Arabia will in any way impact, though, the, the negotiations? Are, do you expect the declaration or reiteration of the Saudi plan of some other commitment uh, from them? Well, I mean, it's interesting, Malcolm, that, that, that the Saudi meeting, to me, I think represents the real opportunity. I, I think that the, the pursuit of the two-state solution mm -hmm. is, uh, is not likely to yield much. Of course, we know that the track record of other presidents trying to pursue a, a two-state solution has been abysmal. Uh, but really what we have right now is an opportunity for what uh, some in the region are calling a regional framework that this is a uh, an opportunity for for President Trump to capitalize on the quiet cooperation that's been taking place between the Saudis and the Israelis and the Emiratis and others uh, in the Middle East, their mutual concern and antipathy for Iran in particular. It's unclear at this point whether uh, President Trump plans to uh, try to come to Saudi Arabia to say, look, we're working on the two-state solution, but in the meantime, let's talk about a regional framework, or whether he's foregone the regional framework, which would be, in my opinion, a huge mistake. This is the way, I think, for President Trump to make history. Uh, in trying to bridge the Arabs and the Israelis together in ways that we could never have imagined 50 years ago uh, as we approach the uh, 50th anniversary of the Six-Day War. So there is this historic opportunity, and then there is more of the same. The fear, of course, among some, and, and myself included, is that the president appears to be going down the more of the same route. But, but that doesn't require adopting the Saudi plan. It means the involvement and the pressure that they can bring to bear on the Palestinian Authority, also offering some of the sweets, but the president gave seems to have given a very big one to Saudi Arabia, which is a hundred billion dollar arms deal that could go they say to three hundred billion. Uh, is there a confirmation of that and and the coincidence of it being announced just before his uh, his trip there? Oh no, I mean I you know first of all, we've seen those numbers. it would be a huge amount of weapons. And I would also note that that Saudi Arabia is already the largest purchaser of uh, of arms. Um, uh, in the world for several years running now. Uh, we, it actually causes a lot of concern for those who are watching Israel's qualitative military edge, or QME as, as, as we call it. And of course, the Saudis right now are not enemies uh, of Israel. They're, I would just say, bitter adversaries uh, with a potential for, for, for coming together to even become allies. But the idea that we would be giving the Saudis this many weapons at this point is deeply disconcerting. It certainly looks as if uh, the president is uh, is really giving them a lot of uh, of what they're looking for and not demanding much in return. And this, I think, getting to your earlier point about Abbas when he was at the White House, 
what we're looking at right now is, is a president that is not necessarily inclined to push the Arabs to deliver uh, on on things that might be beneficial for regional peace, uh, and certainly for the Israelis, and, and I think even more broadly for U.S. interests. He appears to be on a charm offensive with the Arab states, and, uh, and, and, and this rarely works out well. What we should be seeing is more of a give and take. We're speaking with Jonathan Shanzer of the Foundation for the Defense of Democracy. Malcolm Holmline and I are in Tbilisi, Georgia, and we're going to continue in just a moment because we're anticipating the president's arrival in Jerusalem. I want to understand what these bold new steps are that the president is expecting of the Arab leaders by the time he arrives to Jerusalem. This is the LL uh, Middle East Report, special edition from Tbilisi. I'm John Batchelor. John Bassler, this is the John Bassler Show. Malcolm Holmline, my friend and colleague and companion on a special embassy of the LL Middle East Report. We're in Tbilisi, Georgia, which is, of course, a country in the Caucasus, a region that knows internecine warfare. That's the fancy word for feud for the last several thousand years. And we're speaking of another area that knows a feud. That would be uh, the Levant, and we're speaking to Jonathan Shanzo, the Foundation for the Defense of Democracy, anticipating the President's embassy arrival in Jerusalem next Monday when Malcolm and I are in place, and we'll walk all day, Malcolm, because there will be no cars. Be Jonathan, sure. in addition to McMaster, uh, General F Mr. McMaster, using the term self-determination, which went out of date with um, probably Woodrow Wilson in the United States, uh, he, uh, the encouraging remarks in the Reuters report was that McMaster wants Arab and Muslim leaders to, quote, take bold new steps. What the heck, Jonathan? What is this, paint by numbers, 101 Middle East peace, 1962? Where has McMaster been, bold new steps? Jonathan, help us. <laughs> well, I wish I, I could tell you exactly what's going on. We're certainly seeing uh, echoes of Woodrow Wilson's 14 points. We're, uh, I think, seeing a rehash of a lot of the rhetoric that we have seen, uh, you know, uh, certainly since the Oslo process, if not before, uh, where the U.S. government has tried to prompt the Arab world uh, to, to, uh, to do more, to recognize Israel, or to do more with regard to a broader security arrangement in the Middle East. Um, you know, look, I think part of the problem for McMaster is that he has had to make up now for eight years of a uh, of a Middle East policy that has alienated our Arab allies. And I think that it, it, to give him credit, he is up, really up against it, that the United States under the Obama doctrine alienated many of its Arab allies. They lost faith in us. And uh, it is now up to uh, H.R. McMaster, to, um, to General Mattis, uh, and to others within the cabinet to try to reestablish better ties. I think the, the challenge here is to ensure that this doesn't come at the expense of the Israelis, who also have their own frustrations about what happened over the last eight years, uh, that they should not be forced to make concessions that they're not prepared to make right now, given the sorry state of uh, Palestinian politics and, the, and, and general the decline of security throughout the Middle East. So if, if the bold steps at this point are to ask the Arabs to come together in a regional framework that, uh, that tries to pull together Palestinians, uh, Israelis, and the Arab world uh, in uh, security cooperation, intelligence cooperation, and perhaps other areas, economic, agricultural cooperation, that's terrific. That's exactly what the Israelis had in mind, and I think really what a win would look like for the Trump administration. But if what they're trying to do is to get the Arabs to do a little bit more in the fight against ISIS and then promise that in response the Israelis are going to make concessions to the Palestinians, this, I think, is... This is the tired and uh, and just time-worn way of trying to do business in the Middle East. It has not worked up until now. There's no reason to think that it would work again today. 
Uh, and I think it would only lead to frustration, certainly within Israel, but I think ultimately here in the United States and beyond. If it fails, if the talks don't achieve some significant breakthrough, because I think the buildup of expectations it seems to be growing reg, reg, regularly, um, does that constitute a setback then? Does, does the president say, throw up his hands and say, well, I'll walk away and look at other things where I can, areas where I can make a greater contribution? Do they put the pressure on Israel? Do Abbas's demands then loom even larger? Well, I mean, look, this is the, the real key here, that if the president goes all in on the two-state solution and it fails, well, then he may give up on the idea of this regional framework, which, again, I think is the historic opportunity that certainly right now stands in front of the president. And I don't know if he fully understands uh, the opportunity that he's been given, that the Obama administra uh, administration had alienated both the Arabs and Israel alike, and it drew them together in ways that, the, that Obama never realized it might. I mean, he, the guy almost deserves a second Nobel Prize if he had meant to do this. Of course, he didn't mean to, but what he had done is he really did pull them together, and there is this immense opportunity. And if the president decides that the two-state solution is really his top priority, and it does fail, then it does raise the question of whether he will uh, ironically do what Obama had al always said that he was going to do, which is to pivot to Asia, to move away from the Middle East and to give up on the opportunities that currently stand in front of him. So this is the concern that we have right now. It's about prioritizing the opportunities that Trump has in front of him. The big priority, again, I can only stress it so much, is this regional framework where things might, I'm not going to call it a full alliance because I don't think the Saudis have the capacity for that, but you could have this sort of more robust and more formalized uh, intelligence and military and economic and agricultural cooperation, which I think is really what the Israelis have been thinking about. They've been thinking about it for several years, waiting for Obama to leave, thinking that perhaps Trump might be, be the, the one who could shepherd this. And uh, it's, a, it's a curveball, to say the least, that there is now this focus on the two-state solution. Again, especially when you consider that the Palestinians uh, are a house divided. Internecine conflict amongst the Palestinians has been a constant, as has corruption and a failure to lead on the part of the West Bank leadership. So, Jonathan, with, with less than a minute to go, what we, when we saw these alarming headlines, we're now calmed down, I think, Malcolm, because um, these headlines tell us that the president's going to learn a lot. Well, I'm not sure that, that uh, cal it's calming. I think it raises more questions, and we all have to see. I think Jonathan rightly outlined some of the options, and very few of them look very good. And uh, the idea of putting them both in the same room, Malcolm, uh, Bibi Netanyahu and Abbas. Well, Abbas said he would do it if Trump is there. So all I right, think. all right. Then, then we'll see Jonathan's predictions. <laughs> Jonathan, do you say they get in a room together and shake hands? Oh, I don't think that uh, for, for Abbas, uh, he's playing a game of chicken. He's got nothing to lose, right, and right, Bibi right. understands he can't stand in the way. And uh, Bibi has a little to win on it. Jonathan Shanzer, the Foundation for the Defense of Democracy, Malcolm Holmline, and John Bachelor in Tbilisi, Georgia. This is the LL Middle East Report Special Edition. <laughs>